When Granville gets physical, he usually ends up saddle sore and with scabby knees. But that's because the only ride he gets is on the shop bike. When it comes to Pratt Falls, you're not just watching Pratt's fall, but Britain's greatest physical comedian. <laughs> Roll up, ladies and gentlemen, for my next reason, the hapless clown, Granville. Your trouble is that you don't think I can do anything right. <laughs> Go wrong with any tea. Hey, hey! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we really ought to try our some of our new inspirational toilets. <laughs> Now, we all know that Granfill doesn't know who his father is, but that's OK, because neither did his mother. Whether or not the series was named after her libidinous activities is up for conjecture, but one thing is certain, Open All Hours is crammed with the best unmarried mother gags ever to be screened on British television. I'd like to have known my father. Yes. So would your mother. <laughs> On cold paper, reading the script, some of the comments you'd think are brutal. Do you realise that I have never been to a wedding? I know, I know. Yeah, my mother had the same problem. <laughs> but somehow it's in a context and delivered in a, in a manner that takes all the pain out of it and you laugh. Don't start dragging my mother into this. Why not? She was always there being dragged into things. <laughs> Bushes, mainly. <laughs> One day they were talking and uh, Granville says um, to Arkwright, what was my mother really like? No, oh, she always had her, her ready smile and she certainly uh, enjoyed life. Did you get on well together? Oh, yes. We got on fine together. <coughs> she always used to wave to me when she went past in a gentleman's car, sometimes with both feet. <laughs> And I thought that was one of my favourite jokes. We can't hold any sort of conversation without you dragging me mother into it. Why don't you leave her alone? Eh? At least she wasn't money-grabbing all the time. No, I heard she was very reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't just out for what she could get. No, but she always got what she went out for. <laughs> huh. Did you know that open all hours makes wearing an anorak fun? Why? Because the endless procession of superb talent that walks in and out of Arkwright's Emporium means the show is a comedy train spotter's delight. The constant cameos at the counter are my next reason. Firelighters! No. <laughs> One of the beauties of the series was that all those people who came in the shop, some of the very, very small parts. And as anyone who ever saw Naked Jungle will know, there are few actors with smaller parts than Keith Chegwin. Have you got a frozen Zoom? You might well ask some. <laughs> Ronnie said once, if you want Gielgud, ask Gielgud. You can only say no, you know, which is the best attitude, really. Oh, would you give me half a bottle of sherry for our Claudine? Well, that sounds a fair exchange, yeah. <laughs> She's very upset. Your young man's just broke it off. <laughs> oh, my family thought it was brilliant. And when I told them I'd been working with Ronnie Barker, they went, oh, my God, you know, that were a film star. 
How much are these, Mr. Outcry? Oh, that'll be nine, 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 nine. That'll be nine, nine, nine. That'll be nine, nine. Oh, give us a chill. Mrs. Delphine Featherstone. Isn't that a wonderful name, Delphine? I mean, Roy Clark. Brilliant. Well, uh, Mrs. Featherstone. Call me Delphine. D Delphine? <coughs> well, we've got some uh, tin fruit call that somewhere. <laughs> There was a, another character I love called Wavy Mavis. It's a Scotch broth, Mavis. That, that's very exotic. No, I, I haven't got a small tin. I'll only have a large tin. Oh, she's just one of those people who can only hold one thing in her brain at a time. Well, like I can't cut them in half, Mavis. <laughs> it all flops out, you see. I'll tell you what I will do. I'll sell you one large tin and I'll only charge you for the two small tins. Oh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Throughout his long and industrious career, Ronnie Barker has reveled in the glories of the English language. He is the master of the well-turned phrase. He has rhyme. And that is my next reason. Ronnie Barker is a human word processor. Roy Clark's script reaches him as wordplay and ends up being word perfect. <laughs> you don't get much for your money these days. Oh, but then you never did, you see. It's just that the much you didn't get then was much muchier than the, the much you don't get so much of now. <laughs> I know, I can't understand it either. Ronnie Barker's got the most wonderful ear for dialogue and knows if an if is better than an and. Um, and it is not to be faulted on that. Oh, I'll just finish this delicious cup of cocoa and then I'll be off. How dare you? That's coffee. Mm. I should have known, shouldn't I? It's so like you. Full-bodied, indefinable, and, uh, deep with two, uh, two lumps. I like the way he uses words. I love that because I've always loved words and, and the use of them or misuse of them. That warehouse is full of uh, boxes and boxes of mothballs. They're not shifting. And you know why they're not shifting, don't you, eh? Because nobody wants to buy any mothballs anymore. That is why. Nobody buys mothballs anymore because nobody sells mothballs to anybody anymore. And you're one of the nobodies who's not selling mothballs to anyone anymore. It was rather like a wonderful Christmas pudding. There were all these little wonderful bits of fruit, you know, that made up the whole. Oh, that quite made my heart thump. Can you see my bosom pounding? Well, I can uh, see it half pounding. <laughs> Trouble is, you see, with Nurse Gladys, I've got used to th thinking in kilos. Harcourt always had some wonderful expressions, wonderful, uh, a wonderful turn of phrase when he was describing Nurse Gladys. You know, I see her come out of there like a small, highly trained panzer division and my heart lifts. <laughs> Every time I think about her, I feel as if I'm, I'm paddling barefoot through loose change. It's a flowery way of speaking that is still alive, you know, in Yorkshire and, and Lancashire and various places north of Watford. Need to go, you're a past Gary. How do you know what I'm a past? Perhaps I'm a, a past it. <laughs> what? Past what? It. That's what I'm past it. What about it? I'm past it, that's what about it. Now, don't let it be known that I was the one to tell you, but Arkwright's corner shop is full of gossip. Hey, mother, have the American army during the war. <laughs> Not all of them, I trust. You used to go to the corner shop and you'd find out what Mrs. So-and-so was doing and what Mr. So-and-so was doing. I mean, things that didn't appear in the local newspapers. They come at nine o'clock on Thursday night with an ambulance and took him away. They're all expecting him back, but I told her. He looks yellow to me. That means kidneys. I wouldn't give you tuppence for his kidneys. How much is your boiled ham? <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a bit more expensive than his kidneys. It's a working class form of therapy, is gossiping. It's slightly cheaper and, and sort of uh, than paying a therapist. So I think that's, I think we do need it. But one person who is always on the periphery of this mine of salacious information is Granville. No matter how often he tries, he finds himself excluded. But why? 
Well, he was supposed to be the young lad, wasn't he? He was supposed to be... He sort of looked about early 30s, but, but could be read as being sort of 11, really. <laughs> it's not possible for a woman of my age to have a good gossip with a person of your age. He's so subjugated that that part of his development uh, 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 hasn't arrived yet, so he's still... Uh, wanting to know about the secrets of womanhood. All females to me are a magical mystery. <laughs> Don't be stupid, Grumble. Give me a packet of them jam tarts. <laughs> Could you just explain to me why it is never possible for people just to talk to me? Because you're weird. There you are, you see. Probably if he knew a little bit more about life in general, uh, Arkwright would see the back of Granville. Uh, he'd be off. So, in fact, he tried to exclude him. Why is it I never get involved in these powerful little human dramas, eh? I mean, it's not, it's not as though I'm not available. I mean, I could uh, be lured away from stacking carrots by the first determined, mature woman to come along. <laughs> <laughs> well, practically the first, isn't it? His uncle may make him wear a pinny and thwart his every move, but Granville never stops wishing and hoping that one day he may land in a welcoming bosom. You read about these things, young men at a certain time of life. Not so certain, never has been certain. Becoming obsessed by older women. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say obsessed. Granville became a sex symbol for hard-working, very serious, middle-aged northern housewives. I suppose it's because I've got a big bust. <laughs> Things are never what they seem, Granville. Oh, my bosom may look all right when it's all trussed up. But if you was ever there when I let it all loose, lad, <laughs> it'd scare you to death. A couple of girls have eventually gone out with him, you know, in the evening. But mainly it's people walking past with their nose in the air and him falling off the apples. How do, Granville? <laughs> Granville was in that shop from six till eleven at night. <laughs> what chance did the poor sod have? Have a rum truffle. <laughs> You're lovely. I'm not lovely. <laughs> Well, you're nearly lovely. <laughs> Despite Granville's bewildered stumbling through the world of womankind, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and here it is now. The eponymous milk woman. Is she the key to unlock the doors of sexual frustration? Hey, are, Granville. Uh, are you still doing Open University? Yes. Oh, maybe I could come round one night and we could talk about contemporary themes in literature and uh, you could wear that short dress. <laughs> Unfortunately, she was too sophisticated. Uh, she'd never have fallen for Granville, but he couldn't see that because he was... He, he, well, he was locked into this time warp, wasn't he? By the time I'm finished, all the time's either fixed up, washing its hair or gone to bed. You poor love. What you need is a sympathetic married woman. Much to his terror, Granville is often confronted with the possibility of carnal knowledge. Or better still, a sympathetic ex-married woman. <laughs> will he match up, will he throw up, or will he get it up? They say it's like riding a bike. You never forget. Well, he's never ridden this particular bike, so, I mean, the poor boy <laughs> had no way of knowing if he was any good. Me milk woman's coming. <laughs> oh, my God, she's coming. I mean, what do you say to an ex-married person of wide experience? I mean, you know, what have we got in common besides a daily pinter? She may be overflowing with the milk of human kindness, but suppose I lose me bottle. <laughs> Probably milk woman would like to have gone into this rather virgin territory, but... Perhaps a little reticent. Morning, Granville. For me? 
may be wanting a little more from her life than possibly a corner store. Wanting someone a little more like John Wayne than Granville was presenting. And sadly for Granville, Milk Woman did find someone a little more like John Wayne. It's big, isn't it? <laughs> Still, there's always tomorrow. Alone again, naturally.